Hello, everyone. I'm Jose Stevens representing SSP. And I have with me here, John Lockley. Privileged to talk to John Lockley today. I'm going to be interviewing him. He's a traditionally trained and apprenticed African shaman known as a Sangoma from South Africa. And he spent 10 years apprenticing under his teacher, uh, Mangwevu, a well-known medicine woman in the uh, Kosa tribe, the same tribe as uh, Nelson Mandela and Desmond Tutu. And he's been initiated and baptized to a senior level in both the Kosa and Swazi Sangoma lineages. He's the author of the book, Leopard Warrior, and audio teachings, The Way of the Leopard, both produced by Sounds True. And today, uh, John runs Ubuntu, which means uh, humanity, is that right? Yes. Yeah. And uh, rewilding retreats worldwide, helping people to reconnect to their humanity through Earth-centric ceremonies. His latest retreats are dream and tracking, dreams and tracking retreats in the Kalahari Desert in Botswana. So welcome, John. So good to have you here. Uh, you're looking good today. <laughs> Thanks, Jose. You too. <laughs> I mean, we haven't seen each other for quite some time, so we're we're just uh, you know saying hi here. And um, so uh, I'm wondering if you can uh, talk a, a, a bit about the way of the wild and what does what does that mean for our listeners? You know, what do you mean by the way of the wild? Because we we know that. Um, most of the world today doesn't live in the wild. We live in cities. We're divorced from nature a lot. So say something about the way of the wild. Okay, thanks, Jose. Well, the way of the wild is, it's really about connecting to the spirit inside of us, connecting to our own, our own place in Mother Nature. So you could say connecting to our indigenous spirit of us that uh, connects with nature. So most modern people nowadays have got divorced from nature. So um, part of my work is helping people to to reconnect to nature, knowing that they are part of it. So uh, when you're looking mm -hmm. at a bird outside, it, it looks so different from you because it looks different and it seems so different. However, there's some similarities between the bird and the human being. And my work is about helping people unpack that and reconnect to that. So it's not about necessarily going and, and living um, in the wilds for long periods of time and becoming becoming like our ancestors did, you know, thousands of years ago. Mm. Um, what it really is, is it's more like connecting with your spirit and feeling your spirit connected to nature, to, connected to the winds and the trees and the waters. And um, knowing that you are part of all of that. Now, this is a lovely idea. It sounds beautiful and very poetic, but the work is about living it, about really experiencing it with the entirety of your body and your being. So do you find that people are able to do this quickly or somewhat easily, or do you find that it's actually more difficult for people to connect this way at first? It depends on the person and their background. I, that's all I could say. So coming from South Africa, it, it took me a while. I mean, my apprenticeship was 10 years, but that, that's basically all, all the apprenticeship. A big part of the apprenticeship is reconnecting to your spirits. So reconnecting to your ancestors, reconnecting to the earth and the fire. And these are all the ways that we are initiated. We are initiated with the fire, with the earth, with the drum. And um, so with a modern person coming from you could say uh, a place where there is central heating and where the weather inside their homes is regulated the whole time. It, it'll take a little bit of work, a little bit of work, but it, the first thing is not to complain about the weather. That's what I always say to people. <laughs> first lesson is, is not to complain about the weather because the birds don't complain, the animals don't complain. They might feel uncomfortable, but that's part of our reconnecting with nature is embracing that discomfort because once we're embracing that discomfort in terms of the weather outside, then we can also embrace the discomfort in terms of our emotions. 
So people who are struggling with the weather are also going to be struggling with their internal weather. And then the blame starts and then the motions start and there's no end to it. And the end, what actually happens is the environment suffers because human beings mm -hmm. come across as these alien creatures. I mean, the modern human being is seen as so disconnected from the natural world. So the practice is about connecting and the first lesson on the first journey is embracing the weather. So uh, how can people connect to their wild side? What, you know, what are some good ways to do that? How do you? I think the first thing is to accept yourself and, and accepting yourself means accepting your, your neuroses, your anxieties, the internal weather that is making you uncomfortable, i.e. your emotions. The first thing is, is just to accept who you are and, and then also accept the way you look, the color of your skin mm. and uh, your ancestry. And to accept yourself does not say that you're better than anyone, but it just says that you are just as good as anyone else. And, um, and also looking out the window and observing the birds. And another part of the practice is realizing that we as human beings are, are not above the bird, the bird and the bird family. We're not above the the winged creatures, we're not above the, the the insects and the ants. Our job as human beings is to be caretakers of this world, not to be bullies. So part of the practice is accepting yourself and then also looking outside the window and watching the birds and really feeling that you are not better, but you have a job to do to serve and protect this world. And then the next thing is going outside and maybe having to put a jacket on if the wind is up and standing under a tree and embracing the weather, embracing the wind, embracing everything that's around you and just allow yourself to sink into your feet. And then the next thing is, is connecting with your feet, connecting with the earth beneath you. So in the traditional Kosa way, in the Sangoma way, we see it as three gates or three gateways, which is not even expressed verbally, but it's just an implicit movement of spirit. So the first thing we say is that every human being is born looking like a human being, but that doesn't mean that you have attained your humanity. So the first thing for each person to do in order to connect with mother nature and feel their wild side, the first thing they have to do is make a decision to connect to their humanity, to their human spirit, to their soul. And this is the start of alchemy. This is the start of the individuation process is what Jung, Jung spoke about. Mm. And every shaman, every mystic has to go through this journey. The first thing is we have to make a decision to want to connect with our soul, with our spirit. And that's the part of us that is immortal, that goes between the worlds. And this is where people, the first gate is actually the hardest because that's where people are faced with their shadow they're faced with discomfort and they are faced with things which they don't like about themselves. So then they block it or they do what people speak about as spiritual bypass. They just go into the love and light. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and that's very dangerous because you are not embracing what mother nature gave you, which is your emotional body and your, your neuroses and anxieties are also part of who you are. So that's the first gate. And then the second gate in terms of connecting with nature and your wildness is to connect with your roots, is to connect with your ancestors. And uh, for a lot of Westerners, a lot of modern people, that's also difficult. Um, so especially uh, depending on what your background is, you might come from a history of colonizers and you might feel a lot of shame in terms of your ancestors. So the second gate is about honoring your ancestors and giving thanks to them for the lifeblood that they've given you. And that honoring is not um, going into behavior and saying they are good or bad, but just giving thanks for the lifeblood that they've passed on to you. And then the third gate is us connecting to the animal and plant worlds, because once you are connected to your spirit, you're going to start to dream about animals. Once you're connected to your ancestors, 
you are definitely going to start to dream about animals. So the third gate is about turning outwards into the world and looking at the birds and looking at the animals around you and then taking a step in that direction and listening to the call of the wild. So how are the animals speaking to you? And that's when it gets very crunchy. And that's what's opened up my work in terms of these rewilding retreats in the Kalahari Desert. Mm. So uh, this business of ancestors is very interesting to people right now. Yes. It, it's a huge topic and it's rather complex. Um, so I don't want to get too far off on it, but I, I did want to clarify in your tradition, um, are ancestors considered to be the blood ties, the people that you have that are your uh, DNA, you know, the lineage of your DNA, or do the the ancestors just include all the people that came before you, whether or not they're blood related? Okay, that's a good question. So the first would be, when we speak about ancestors, we speak about those that are connected to you in DNA. However, okay. <laughs> um, there's also a set of ancestors, which is what we call the the adopted ancestors. And that's where you ah. might have wisdom keepers coming to you and teaching you, even though you might not be connected literally in blood. So this is what's happened to me in terms of the Krosa, the Krosa um, family that I've been adopted into. My teacher dreamt about me and I dreamt about her. And, uh, and then she said something very interesting after me being an apprentice for five years. She, she said to everyone, and the seek up she looked at them all strongly because there was a lot of animosity towards me because of my white skin because we have mm. to understand that it was apartheid in south africa which was basically it was a civil war in south africa and i was the first um, white person in the area to to be a, an apprentice sangoma and I, i'm still one of the one of the only only white guys in that area actually um but anyway so it was it was a, it was a difficult time it was a difficult time so um she looked at everyone and she presented her wrist and she said and seek up i cut my arm red blood flows and i cut your arm red blood flows underneath the river all the peoples of man mingle and speak to each other gamanya maklesh and our pupa abalungu gamanya maklesh utringul and daba u pupa amakosa abandu bafan she says sometimes i dream about the white ancestors who come to me and teach me things sometimes john dreams about the closer ancestors that come to him and teach him things abandu bafana she says we are all the same Ubuntu Bunzulu. These are the depth of humanity teachings. Oh, that's it's beautiful. Very, very simple, but it's very direct and very strong based on experience. So her experience was literally, she has and continues to dream about ancestors from all different nations, and in particular, white people who come and show her things and bless her. And the same thing happens to me. And so there was this real merging of spirit between the two of us. And this is what has encouraged me to to spread the word about African shamanism as not something demonic, but something actually extremely holy and beautiful. And that our history in South Africa and the world in terms of shamanism and African shamanism has been wrong. And, uh, and we need mm -hmm. to forgive the early colonizers and early missionaries for the mistakes that they made based on ignorance. So it's mm -hmm. not about suddenly going into hatred and getting angry, but it's about forgiving for the mistakes of the past and actually saying, okay, these are the true teachings of uh, Amakosa. These are the true teachings of the Kosa people, which is about Ubuntu and how we all connected as one human family, which opens up many possibilities of healing, apprenticeships, and also um, love. Yeah. Uh well, um, you alluded to this a moment ago. Mm -hmm. I just want to go into it just a, a, a little bit more here. 
Uh, what's the purpose of dream work in your tradition? To wake up. <laughs> <laughs> in a simple, simple way, the purpose of dream work is to, to wake up. And the way we wake up is sema mela kamata. So in English, that means we are listening to the great one, the great dreamer. Mm. So uh, what I can say to you is the Sangoma medicine people in Southern Africa, their ancestors were related to the Khoisan. So the earliest, the, one of the oldest living indigenous groupings of people that used to live along the coastline of South Africa. And then they moved more into the interior and they had this very, very powerful way of connecting to spirit through the trance dance. And it's still happening in parts of Botswana, Namibia and the Kalahari. But I'm, I'm mentioning them to you because the, the Bushmen or Khoisan people say that this life is a dream being dreamt by the great dreamer. So the focus of us connecting to our dreams is to connect to the great dreamer, the dreamer behind the dream the dancer behind the dancers. And once we connect to the great dream, or we could say the great spirit, then we connect to our life purpose. And we are, we are shown a glimpse of, of what we are here to do. We are shown a glimpse of our soul, of that immortality of spirit that we have. And once that happens, um, your life starts to change and there's more empathy, more compassion. And as I said in the beginning, you are more connected to your human spirit, which means that you start working towards the job of a human being, which is the custodian of this planet, of this earth. Uh, this brings up so much. It's too bad we don't have three hours here. <laughs> uh, I'm just reminded of the Sequoia people um, who uh, live in Ecuador. And that's basically very similar to what they say is that this life is a dream and that we're dreaming it up and well, very much many of the same things that you just mentioned here. And I know that Tibetan Buddhists have a whole dream tradition that's not very well known, but they work with dreams and they say pretty much the same thing that you just said. So this is a seems to be a worldwide phenomena in um, in certain shamanic traditions anyway. So it's very interesting. Um, and in your tradition, they, they work with dreams as well, don't they? Oh, uh, yeah. And, uh, you know, I've been st uh, studying the Toltec tradition for quite some time. That's the tradition that comes out of central Mexico. Mm. And of course, I'm half Mexican, so I'm very interested in that. And the Toltecs uh, have a very strong dream work tradition where they spend a great deal of time um, uh, working with their dreams, programming their dreams, developing lucid dreaming, all those things. So this is so, um, well, it's really fascinating to me. Um, but let's, let's uh, maybe go into some other areas here. Uh, you also mentioned animals. And so um, why, why is it important? And this may sound obvious, but Actually, I think it needs to be asked, why, why are animals so important to include in the shamanic practice? I think, again, to keep the answer really simple, animals help to humanize us. Animals help us to connect with our powers of empathy. Mm. So let's say someone in one extreme is... is like at the far extreme, like someone who's a serial killer or someone who's a murderer who doesn't have any feeling for life. In the Buddhist terminology, um, we would say that person is very ignorant because they are not feeling the sanctity of life. And also they are not feeling their own spirit. They're not feeling their own power of empathy. So yeah. this is some kind of an intelligence, actually. Empathy and compassion is some kind of intelligence because once you feel a connection to an animal that animal starts to teach you via mental telepathy you start to learn the language of nature which is not english it's not Krosa, it's not in the swazi french german the language of nature 
is the language of telepathy, is the language of the heart. So when we are connecting to an animal, let's just say you fall in love with a cat. Hmm. Just that action of falling in love with that cat is helping you to fall in love with all cats. It's helping you to fall in love hmm. with other animals as well. It, it breaks, it thaws the iciness around your heart. And what, when that breaks, there's emotion, maybe there's tears, and then you're able to look into the eyes of a child. You're able to look into the eyes of another human being and something, something changes. Mm -hmm. And then you can also look into the eyes of a wild animal, a bird or a, or a leopard. And, um, and you start to learn that, that, that experience with the cat starts to teach you the language of nature. And as you learn that language, you as a human being change. Um, and it's very important nowadays that our spiritual practice is not involved with just mindfulness and meditation. And I mean, it's a bit derogatory, but people talk about nasal gazing, you know, um, it's not just about our own enlightenment and us feeling good and having a Zen moment. You know, it's not about that anymore. You know, uh -huh. these animals that are getting extinct on a daily basis, these animals that are dying indiscriminately. So as human beings, we have a responsibility to sharpen up our powers of empathy and compassion and just loving another being is the is is well that's what spirituality is all about it's not just about ourselves so falling in love with your cats or the cat next door i'm developing this relationship with the cat next door right now and my <laughs> little boy absolutely loves this cat and it's amazing to see him crossing our paths and uh, and what develops from that <laughs> <laughs> well you, you... You certainly picked uh, the, the right example because I have two cats and uh, I love my cats and they've taught me so much. And what you just said is um, so true, mm. you know, mm. the, the, the ability to look in their eyes and have them look back and something grows out of that, something beautiful. So, um, yeah. well, thanks for that. Um, so, um, <clears throat> How can animals reconnect us to our, our, our purpose or our calling, you know, our life work? And um, uh, you started to address that. Maybe you said all you wanted to about that, but is there anything else? So how do animals help us with our life purpose? Yeah. Well, I think the first thing is, is for people to start to pay attention to the animals that cross their path and also the animals that they dream about. So we talk about tracking. So learning to track your experiences, your spiritual experiences, and also your experiences in the waking state. So not just your dream experiences. Over time, a pattern will emerge in terms of those animals that are coming to speak to you. So animals, or let's say the call of the wild, we are being called into the wilderness because the wilderness is calling us. We are searching for connection with nature. Nature is also searching for connection with us. Mm -hmm. So when we start to listen to the various calls of the animals that are speaking to us in dreams or in the waking state, and we start to pay attention to that and maybe journal it in a dream diary or, or a journal, something starts to take shape. Something starts to happen. Okay, so I can just give you a very brief story around this, just very, very short uh, for the listeners. Yeah. I, I wrote a book which you're familiar about called Leopard Warrior, and um, I, I don't like to go right to the end of the book, but um, people can read the book. But at the end, there's a moment where I follow a leopard actually into the bush, and um, and in real life, that's actually what happened. I. I was approached by a man in the Kalahari Desert in Botswana who said that he had had this very mystical experience in animal community. He's an animal communicator, okay? And he's a, mm -hmm. he's a tracker, he's a safari guide, and he's an animal communicator. And he said he had this mystical experience with this wild leopard. And this wild leopard said to him that he needed to contact me and bring me to Botswana as soon as possible because the leopard wanted to download information to me. <laughs> and those are the words he used. And when you meet him, 
um, this tracker friend of mine, he is not hippie at all. He is man of the earth. He looks like, a, <laughs> you know, he looks like a, like a baobab tree, you know, he's, he's very <laughs> solid and he doesn't use that language. So when he WhatsApp me and he reached out to me and he said, John, this leopard wants to download information to you. You need to get to Botswana as soon as possible. When can you get on a plane and come and be with me in, in the Okavanga Delta? And on that stage, I was actually on a book tour. I was just about to come and see you, actually. <laughs> this is a few years ago, um, Jose. And, um, and I said, okay, I can get there in February. You know, and he said, fine. So I got there to the Okavanga Delta. I went into the bush. I wasn't able to meet his teacher, this leopard, but I did meet um, the granddaughter that was coming into the lineage. And, um, and I had all these incredible experiences. So what happened, what she wanted me to do in terms of she wanted to download this information to me. And that's actually what started to happen to me. Oh. And then just before we started our dreams and tracking retreats in the Kalahari, I said to my tracker friend, I said, Awan, has Matsebe spoken to you? Because at this time, Matsebe actually transitioned, she died. And he, and he was very, very saddened by this. And he said to me, mm. no, Matsebe hasn't spoken to me for a while, John. I said, well, here's some African herb. I want you to smoke this. I want you to bless yourself with this. And then let's see if you have any contact with Matsebe from the spirit world. And he said, okay. And we both went to sleep in our tents. And then the next morning, I went and sat down with him, had some coffee, and he had this incredible smile on his face, this beautific smile. And mm. I said, what's up, Owen? And he said, Matsebe spoke to me. I said, really? He said, yeah, and it was incredible. He said, Matsebe came to me in the dream, and she was walking with two younger leopards, and she was guiding me along the road. And, um, and he said, you know, it's very close to where we are right now. I said, really? He said, yeah. So he said, once we finish breakfast, I'm going to take you in the Jeep and we're going to go to that place. So that's what we did. We finished our breakfast. We jumped in the Jeep and we drove to that place that he dreamt about. And he was driving for some time. And eventually there was a quietness that descended on Arwen. And he looked at me and he just pointed his finger down on the ground. And there were these tracks. There were these leopard tracks. And we got out of the car. He pointed huh. to the leopard tracks and he said, there's two leopard tracks of young leopards, just like I saw in the dream. Wow. And the third leopard track was Matsebe watching us from the spirit world. And we didn't need to know anymore. We just knew that we had been blessed and that Matsebe was watching out over us for this retreat. Yeah. Wow, that's a powerful story. <laughs> <laughs> so that download of information is from nature, is from this, this wild leopard. And that became the, 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 the cornerstone of the practice um, for me in the Kalahari, teaching people mm -hmm. how to connect to their wildness and how to connect to their, the animals in their life, the, the wild ones, the wild animals, you know. Well, that leads right into what I was going to ask next, which is, um, can you actually say a, a few words to, for the listeners again? Um, to help inspire them to walk on their wild side. Yes, the first thing to do is to not be afraid of your shadow. I know, mm. I know that's a big thing. Um, just accept your insecurities, accept your anxieties and your neuroses. Fall in love with yourself, but not in a narcissistic way. Just see yourself as a child of nature and and then go and stand under a tree and however it is whatever the weather condition is outside just accept it mm. and watch the birds if you get lost in terms of your direction you don't know where you're going just see these little birds these little sparrows i used to observe sparrows in the canadian winter and it was minus 30 outside and these little sparrows survived they didn't just survive they thrived mm. and if a little ball of fur can survive in the harshest climates in the world. It's a sign that you can survive as well. You know, the listener can, the person who's struggling with hopelessness and depression, just look at the birds, look at the animals, breathe it in and trust 
trust in the weather, trust in nature, trust in the wind. Do a few prayers and allow yourself the opportunity of connecting to your own spirit, to your own wildness, because it's there inside you. It's inside of all of us. Um, is, is there something that we haven't uh, touched on here so far that you want to make sure to address, you know, that I haven't asked you yet? Well, I think in keeping with, with the theme of what I've just said about connecting to your wildness, I can also say, love your ancestors. Uh -huh. Don't be ashamed of them and don't be ashamed of yourself and don't judge them. Okay, some of them made terrible mistakes, but they didn't all make mistakes. Yeah. It's not about judging their behavior. Some behavior is wrong, that's clear. Don't feel ashamed of your ancestors and who you are, because that becomes a block in your spiritual progress. So oh, that's so important. Yeah, there's something you feel you want to do on behalf of your ancestors, like a reconciliation ceremony or saying sorry to some, some people that your ancestors hurt. Then do that and then let it go, because you are a child of nature and you are just as good as anyone else. So that shame and that guilt is not going to help anyone. But if there is a voice inside of you that needs to express um, forgiveness or um, an apology or something, then do it on behalf of your ancestors mm -hmm. and then go about the job of being a child of nature. Um, you know, this ancestral piece, when we're talking about ancestors in the African way, we don't just talk about five, four generations. We go back 2000 years. Mm. So as European or Caucasian people, if you go back 2000 years, like in the Celtic tradition, we practiced in the Irish tradition in a very, very similar way to my closer friends in terms of the practices of ancestors, the practice of mysticism, the practice of connecting to the wildness. But something with technology and modernization and industrialization and colonization something got fractured. Yeah. Now in this generation, we have responsibility as current living ancestors to heal the past. So what you're talking about here is um, what I like to call uh, uh, letting go of the baggage, you know, lightening the load so that we can be free to move forward and not be, you know, carrying around these suitcases of from the past. And um, certainly guilt and shame is a lot of baggage to carry. And it's very distracting. It absorbs an enorm enormous amount of energy that could be used for forward movement, for growth and expansion and development. And um, so I, I really like what you said here about letting go of the guilt and the shame and healing that. He, it's a, it's, it's actually one of the first steps is healing the, um, that which uh, the baggage uh, weighs us down. And, um, uh, and I, as I wander around and talk to people in various countries and places, I, I'm sure you've come across this too. There's a tremendous amount of guilt and shame uh, that people are holding on to and actually indulge in. And it's a really important message to say, put it all down. So it's also a Buddhist teaching, mm. put it all down, you know, like let go of all that and just be here and be present. And that's where the power is. So um, there's threads in all the things that you've said that come together for the, the paint a really beautiful picture of um, of this path, the shamanic path. Uh, it gets to the heart of it, really. Uh, the shamanic path, in my experience, is very simple, but very rich at the same time. So I love to hear it articulated by someone else sometimes, <laughs> you know, like from another tradition, because it it's just another way of seeing what's universally true. 
Um, That's right. Anything yes. else here that that you wanted to make sure that you included that we haven't touched on yet? Um, I think we touched on everything. It's just it's probably good for people just to remember that the the words that my teacher spoke about, which I mentioned to you, and I can repeat that, and that means the sika apa egazini bomf, the sika wena, the sika nina egazini bomf. If I cut my arm, red blood flows. If I cut your arm, red blood flows. And uh, it's really important to remember that. And um, I remember sharing the story in Oxford with a friend of mine, or this client who came to work with me. And he said he was in tears when I said that to him. And he said that happened to him. And he was part of the anti-apartheid movement. And he had this hatred towards the system. Mm. And, um, and then he almost died after doing a tour in Sweden, he almost died because he developed malaria. And he had this blood transfusion. And when he came out, his sister said to him, now you got the you got the blood of a white man, you got the blood of a white man. And he was like, what? What? How could I have the blood of a white man? She said, yeah, there's blood transfusion in Sweden. Like, what are the chances of there's black people in Sweden? And, um, and she was just playing with him. She was just playing with him. But because he was so like he was so aggressive with this anti-apartheid movement, um, he developed this block in his mind about uh, about white people. And he said to me, um, "It was true." He said that uh, that this, this blood had saved his life. And uh, and then his his sister, who was a nurse, said to him, "She was only joking." She said, "You know, all blood is the same. All blood <laughs> is the same. It doesn't matter where it comes from." As long as it's your blood type, it's the same. And that changed who he, it just changed him completely. It changed all the animosity he had. It just changed everything. It was a spiritual experience for him. Anyway, I just want to share that with everyone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, that's beautiful. <laughs> well, I know that you're, you'll be running some uh, dreams and tracking retreats here in, in the Kalahari and um, uh, during this next year. Um, is there anything you want to say about those that can yeah, thanks, Jose. Okay. I can just yeah, I can just share a few words around that. So we so we leading dreams and tracking retreats in the Kalahari Desert next year. It's three retreats in February and March, and it'll be led by myself and also by my tracker friend in Botswana, Owen Myberg. And um, Owen has like over 20, 25 years experience as a tracker, um, as an animal communicator. And and I've got um, a similar number of years in terms of connecting with ancestors and connecting to the shamanic way of, of working with nature and working with dreams. So we're going to be teaching people and leading them. Um, it's going to be seven days in the Kalahari, and then there's going to be an optional three days in the Okavanga Delta. And the Okavanga Delta is seen as one of the seven jewels of Africa. And the Kalahari is seen as actually the birthplace of mankind. So the earliest remains of human beings were found in the Kalahari Desert. So this is a pilgrimage, a very, very deep pilgrimage for people where they're being called to come to the birthplace of their essence, you can say. And then we're going to be teaching them these ancient ways to help them to connect to their dreams and their visions. So people can find out more on my website at johnlockley.com and they can check out the, 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 the retreats there and the booking process and everything else. Well, this has been um, not only really informative, but uh, a, a really wonderful way of learning uh, a little bit about the bigger world of shamanism, the, the, the shamanic tradition as it is in South Africa which I know is very strong and very powerful, but you know, um, many of us in other parts of the world don't, don't hear enough about that. And it's really nice to have uh, these um, streams of traditions and information that comes from these traditions come together and to know something about other traditions and the shamanic path. So um, I really want to thank you for uh, taking your time and, uh, informing us and teaching us. It's wonderful to see you again. Thank you, Jose. And, uh, Thanks for inviting me. <laughs> yeah, uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, it's wonderful. Thank you, Jose.